Well, I, I think this may be the case and that they're making the wrong decisions, but I still think we have to go back to some fundamentals. And that is, uh, what are the rules? What does the Constitution say? Today, so many assume that they can do what they want depending on the circumstances. That's generally what is accepted. And my argument would be is, what does the Constitution say? They say the president's in complete charge of foreign policy because the Constitution says so. But the word foreign policy doesn't even exist in the Constitution. And most of the rules and regulations are designed for the Congress. And yet, they say, well, the president's commander-in-chief. He can move the troops wherever he wants. But, you know, they didn't even believe in standing armies back there. And here we're moving hundreds of thousands of troops, not a, if not a half a million troops around the world, at the whims of a president without the consent of the people. If there was one thing everyone agreed on when the Constitution was being written and debated, it was that powers needed to be divided. Everybody agreed. The anti-federalists agreed as well as the federalists. And the, the one power in particular that they wanted splintered up was the power regarding war. The uh, president was uh, designated as the commander of the forces, but Congress was given the power to declare war and raise the money. In fact, for the, the anti-federalists, this was not enough. They thought that there was too much power in the Congress. They thought the Congress shouldn't be allowed to raise the money. If it could declare war, someone else should be raising the money, namely the states. They wanted it even more dispersed. Madison and those people knew very well, as, as we've heard this quote already, that uh, the, the, the executive, the uh, autocratic executive, is what needs to be feared in this area of war. And war begets big spending, big taxes, regulation, all the things that they didn't want. They wanted a system that would not be easy to get into war. But it's, it's almost a cliche now that the president is in charge. And, and the other cliche that I disapprove of so strongly is that foreign policy has to be bipartisan, as if there shouldn't be a debate, as if both parties have to go along. Foreign policy and debate ends at our, at our borders. Well, one of the great non-interventionists, uh, Felix Morley, put it that uh, we always hear that uh, politics stops at the water's edge. He says politics stops at the water's edge when policies stop at the water's edge. And right now, policies don't stop at the water's edge. That's right. So it should well, be made. come back to that, that point. And let's get back to the water's edge in just a moment. Joe, you, you were starting to get into the idea of the general growth of government and what that means in it. Well, I was taking off a little from what uh, Ron and Sheldon have already said, Mike, that uh, the, the Constitution authorizes Congress to exercise certain powers, and it lists those powers. The idea was that these were the only powers that Congress would have, i.e. that the federal government would really have, because the executive merely carries out the will of Congress. Now, the uh, Congress is no longer inhibited. It's laughable to suggest that they confine themselves to those 17 enumerated powers. And by the same token, the executive has become interventionist in all sorts of ways, too. And it's as if all power has been given to the federal government, and now they're only haggling about which department gets to make these decisions on when to intervene domestically or abroad. Let me follow up on that because there's another concern that I have, not only about the bigness of uh, our central government and this uh, militant foreign policy that we maintain, but, but what about the shift now to an international approach? I mean, it's uh, sort of a UN operation. Uh, George Bush likes to use this term, the New World Order. Should that be something that we should be concerned about, or do you think these are uh, careless cliches? Well, I think we're being handled a very dangerous false alternative. Uh, the alternative is either we do this under the auspices of the UN with everyone else, taking our marching orders from everybody else, or we pursue a unilateral interventionist policy throughout the world. I want no part of those two policies. I want the good old-fashioned American non-interventionist, some call isolationist foreign policy, in the military sense purely. Well, ironically, it was uh, not until the middle of November that Congress began to assert its own prerogatives. And the only check on the presidential action in the Gulf came from other countries, not from the UN alone, but from the demands of the coalition. So the checks and balances that should have been applied by Congress then were applied only by these foreign entities. Well, yes, and if, and if we don't have those checks and if the American people don't place their uh, check on it, I think this is a very dangerous thing for the fact that uh, our young men can lose their lives under the command of a UN uh, army. Uh, of course, this was started with uh, 
Korea. But I think this is part of the problem from Korea on especially. Uh, we no longer declared war. I had a member of Congress once tell me he said he never expected Congress ever to declare war again. And he thought this was a good policy because mm -hmm. we lived in modern times and it was too cumbersome to go through this. Well, we live in Orwellian times, I would say not modern times. <laughs> yes, the right. idea where if we don't call it war, it's not war. It's a police action, incursion or something else. Yeah, like but uh, what is the great danger of all this? I mean, obviously there are great threats to us. Well, as I said the other day uh, to a little group in Rhode Island, the U.S. Constitution no longer poses a serious threat to our form of government. Ron, our time's getting a little short. We're going to need to wind okay. things up a bit. Let me ask each of you to comment on the short run for a moment. Joe Sobrin, what's the next step? What's the first thing that ought to happen to get us on the road to a better foreign policy? Well, I think that foreign policy is as to which goes abroad least, and uh, as far as military action goes. I think that there is now appearing a popular reaction, which Congress is expressing, uh, against this this war at first the, uh, the the public was pretty acquiescent I think that's changing and I think one very good thing about mr. Bush's manifest incompetence is that it has helped to demolish the old mystique of the all-wise presidency Sheldon Richmond what's your view is there one thing we could do right now the one thing we can do I think is to uh, communicate to uh, the leaders in this country that we have had it with this sort of foreign policy. We don't want to pay the taxes for it. We don't want our sons and fathers and the sisters and mothers dying over this. We don't want our uh, money flowing out into foreign aid. I mean, the whole thing is is, of a, is one whole program that needs to be dismantled, and uh, we 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 have to tell them that we're ma we're mad about it. We have to stop putting up with it. Ron, your wrap up? I think we should obey the law. We should obey the Constitution. We should not permit the president to pursue war without the consent of the people. I don't believe for a minute the American people would endorse war if they realized what's happening. They went along at the beginning of most of these adventures, but eventually when the body bags come back, the people wake up. And I think it's very important for the people to realize at the beginning, not to join the crowd. There was a book out once called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And when I think of that book and when I think of how the American people join and jump on the bandwagon and rush out and are enthusiastic but later on they change let's change our attitude first let's follow the rules that's where we'll have to leave it I want to thank our panelists for being with us and you for watching